Thank you for joining us today for the second discussion in our Change Starts Here webinar series. This series builds on the work of organizations and communities supported through the Brooklyn Community Foundation, Brooklyn COVID-19 Response Fund. We come together today, a day after much of the nation breathed a momentary sigh of relief in reaction to the guilty verdicts for, for Derek Chauvin. And mid exhale, we had our breath taken away once again by learning of the almost simultaneous killing of a 16 year old, Makia Bryant by a Columbus pol police officer in Ohio. I'd like to offer a moment for collective breath and reflection. Thank you. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, xenophobic attacks, racism, and violence against the Asian American and Pacific Islander community have risen, and local community-based organizations have been mobilizing to combat Asian hate. In today's conversation, we will discuss what has been missing from the greater conversation on AAPI hate and how communities can unite in solidarity to it to effectively disrupt and repair the caused harm by anti-AAPI discrimination and racism. To encourage your engagement, I'd like to share a few logistical notes. Throughout our session today, please submit any questions that you have using the Q&A box. You can find the Q&A box on the bottom of the screen. We will address your questions towards the end of the webinar. We will also have, we also have live closed captions available. Please look at the bottom of your screen to turn those on by clicking the arrow on closed caption and selecting show subtitle. Throughout the webinar, you can look back at what has been said by clicking on view full transcript or adjust the size of the captions on your screen by clicking on subtitle settings. Before diving into our incredible panel, a few words about Brooklyn Community Foundation. Founded in 2009, we are the first and only public foundation dedicated to New York City's largest borough. Everything we do is rooted in our explicit commitment to racial justice. To date, we have granted more than $60 million to vital organizations working across our borough. We launched the Brooklyn COVID-19 Response Fund in, March, in early March, 2020, and it was among the first funds nationally to prioritize addressing the pandemic's impacts on Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color. In the first phase of this work, we distributed $3.3 million through 420 grants to 246 organizations across the borough. Thanks to the generosity of more than 1,600 donors, we were able to do that amazing work. We have supported and continue to support organizations providing urgent and ongoing direct relief to communities in Brooklyn to alleviate needs caused and intensified by the COVID-19 pandemic, including anti-Asian bias and violence, food insecurity, and lost wages. We are in our second phase of grant making, which will bring the fund's total commitment to nearly $7 million. We continue to fundraise for our Brooklyn COVID-19 Response Fund because we know that there is still a long road ahead. The systemic inequities exacerbated by the pandemic will not disappear when the pandemic subsides. We, begin phase, we began phase two last fall with Brooklyn Insights 2020, an eight week community engagement process to learn from and partner with the communities most impacted by the pandemic to identify and invest in community led solutions uh, to achieve structural change as well as address urgent ongoing needs. We recently released our report on Brooklyn Insights 2020, which I encourage you to view at bcfny.org slash COVID-19 slash phase two. Now turning to today's panel. When we speak about fighting AAPI hate, we use a number of terms to describe how that hate manifests. Before we begin, we'd like to define some of these terms for our audience so that we can establish a shared understanding of their meaning. Xenophobia. 
the fear and hatred of strangers or foreigners, and any attitude, behavior, practice, or policy that explicitly or implicitly reflects the belief that immigrants are inferior to the dominant group of people. Discrimination. The unequal treatment of members of various groups based on race, ethnicity, gender, gender expression, socioeconomic class, sexual orientation, physical or mental ability, religion, citizenship status, or a combination of those identified and or other categories. And racism. The systematic subjugation of members of targeted racial groups who hold less socio-political power and or are racialized as non-white, as a means to uphold white supremacy. Racism differs from prejudice, hatred, or discrimination because it requires one racial group to have systematic power and superiority over other groups in society. In short, xenophobia being fear and hatred of the other, discrimination being unequal treatment based on someone's identity, and racism being oppression enacted by a racial group that holds systemic power in society. Now that we've laid that out, I'd like to introduce our panel. Our panel moderator today is Safan Kim, a reporter with WABC-TV New York. Safan joined the Eyewitness News team as a reporter in September 2015. Safan is a member of the Asian American Journalists Association and serves as co-chair of its Media Watch Committee. He has reported extensively on hate crimes and discrimination against Asian American Pacific Islander communities in the past year. Our panelists include Alice Wong from Chinese American Planning Council, Joanne Yu from Asian American Federation, and Karen Zhou from Homecrest Community Services. Alice Wong is the Chief of Staff of CPC and is responsible for ensuring the efficient and effective operation of executive affairs management of all board of directors and governance matters, and oversight of affiliate relations and special projects. Alice is a product of Manhattan's Chinatown, SUNY New Waltz, and NYU Wagner School of Public Service. Joanne Yu is the executive director of Asian American Federation, which works in partnership with 70 member and partner organizations to represent the collective interests of the 1.3 million Asian New Yorkers across critical issue areas such as immigration integration, excuse me, immigrant integration, mental health, economic development, and civic engagement. Joanne has nearly 20 years of experience in program management and operations, community development, and immigrant rights advocacy. Karen Jo is the Executive Director of Homecrest Community Services a nonprofit multi-social service agency that serves over 4,000 Asian immigrants and older adults in Brooklyn. She oversees operations of two community senior centers in Sheepshead Bay and Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. I'd like to invite all of our guests and welcome all of our guests. Um, and I'll pass the mic over to Safan to kick off our panel. So hi, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I wanna first start by thanking the Brooklyn Community Foundation for hosting this discussion because you know it just goes to show uh, how important the organization believes this discussion is to elevate that and to everyone who's actually tuning in right now because you know you've made an active decision to be a part of this discussion and oftentimes I get asked what can we do in this moment and I always answer that by saying first you can start by listening so for everyone tuning in and listening thank you so uh, let me start with the obvious thing here look over the past few months we have been seeing imagery and attacks, incidents of bias that quite frankly have been disturbing to so many of us. To many of us, it's been shocking. To some of us, it has not been. But I think we can all agree that this has been deeply painful, really traumatic to watch. And uh, in the interest of having an honest discussion, I can admit that this has been heavy for me too, right? Over the past several months, I've had serious struggles emotionally with what is going on here. And for every one of our panelists who are joining us, you are also on the ground in these communities connected directly to the real palpable sense of fear um, among us. So I want to start by the most obvious human question. I'll start with Alice. How are you holding up? Um, well, I'm still here and our organization is still here. I 
think that I, it's the most obvious statement, but I think we're all tired. We, it's, this is, even though there have been headlines in the last few months, really, I think the, all, the, all of the panelists and you know that this is an issue that's impacted our community for over a year. So I'm hopeful that, and I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that we're having this conversation and hopefully um, we'll continue towards progress to end this issue. Joanne, same question to you. How are you holding up? Stefan, this is what we say to each other when we talk. Um, and so I appreciate that. I, I appreciate the Brooklyn Community Foundation. Um, yeah, I guess I'm at the rage part of all of this, the steps of uh, emotion. I think there were times that, you know, um, I know that still some of us are grieving. We're all grieving in every way possible, but um, my grief has now turned to complete rage um, at the invisibility of our community and the sense of helplessness, exactly what you said, the frustration that, you know, our seniors are afraid to leave our homes, the, the frustration that we're afraid to leave our homes. Um, and um, trying to figure out how to get through the night without waking up in just absolute cold sweat. Um, and um, trying to turn my anger into something really productive, not just for the Asian American community, for, but for the larger conversations that we need to have about equity in this country. Interesting, I think we all process trauma differently. I think I started out with the rage and now I'm in sort of the grieving period right now, right? So it's, uh, we all sort of process this trauma differently. Karen, same question to you, uh, deeply traumatic. Um, how are you hanging in there? Are you hanging in there? You, unmute yourself first. There we go. Nice, um, good to see everyone here. Um, I can relate to all the uh, speakers. I feel a mix of emotions. Um, this has been certainly a very trying time um, on, on many fronts. Uh, I lost someone very close to me to COVID. Um, and, um, you know, he was um, an, an inspiration because he's, he, he was always about uh, standing up against uh, social injustice, discrimination, and um, inequities. And so, um, you know, his last photos that he took uh, was of anti-hate rally um, um, focused on uh, um, an attack of an Asian woman in the subways. Um, so I know that um, it certainly brings a lot of anger um, that this is happening. And um, also, it also makes me sad because um, you know, seeing what happened in Atlanta and um, these are people that look like me, look like my family, look like my neighbors. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's certainly um, uh, just, you know, it just takes, takes a lot out of you just to see what's happening in this country, how it's become so divisive that it's, you know, that we're not focused on healing, uh, but we're, we're just so much on hate. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's been a very difficult time. You know, in the interest of historical context and to appropriately honor um, Corky, because we're talking about Corky Lee here, for anyone who doesn't know, Corky was, you know, the lifeblood of the community. He was a photojournalist who used to always say, and I quote him, justice through photography, right? He fought this fight long before this fight came to our doorstep um, since he was young, right? So we need to, I think, recognize the fact that we're in this moment right now because of people like Corky. I don't think that we even have this conversation, quite frankly, had it not been for the, the, the struggles and, and the fight and the path that Corky laid down for us. So I, I do wanna recognize that. Um, he was always there um, capturing moments of history that quite frankly, when this country erased the community's uh, 
part of the history. He was there to make sure we weren't forgotten. So a uh, moment to really recognize that there. Um, you know, I want to move on to this, this other question, which, you know, oftentimes gets asked, uh, you know, we, we, we know in the community that the AAPI community is not a monolithic community, right? We're, we're so diverse. We have different, you know, languages, different cultural norms, different religions in often cases. And, you know, I often get asked how this impacts the different communities within the AAPI community. But I'm gonna sort of flip this question on its head because I actually see this in the inverse way, right? Uh, unlike the Chinese Exclusion Act or the Japanese internment or the LA riots where Korean, Japanese, Chinese communities went through struggle and pain and they, not for nothing, stood there alone without advocacy and allies next to them. This is a moment for the first time in our history, which I think is why we're at this inflection point well, whether you're Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Filipino, it's all go back to China, right? It's all, it's all, we're all under this sort of equal threat. So uh, I'm going to start with Joanne on this one. Uh, how has this moment sort of connected us, bound us together in this sort of unprecedented way when before this moment, we had been so, I, I guess, in some ways, not as united? W what's that been like on the ground, Joanne? Um, well, I think any, you know, the, the challenge, you know, I often say, you know, our community's greatest strength is our diversity. Um, and oftentimes our greatest challenge is our diversity. We don't share a common language. We don't share um, a common history um, in our home country or even here. Um, and we don't share the same immigrant experience. But what we are bound by is this label of the Pan-Asian community. And I think um, the one thing that we understand is that at different times, our community has been, various communities have been under attack, and that's beyond the Asian American community. It's the Latino community, it's the Black community, always the Black community, um, the LGBTQ community. Um, and I think the, sh the, the challenge right now is, um, you know, as the Federation, one thing that we think about a lot is um, what our community is going through and how do we connect with other communities of color who've been through this, right? And and oftentimes, you know, we also I also think about how do we move forward um, out of COVID, right? Like we were all stuck at home during COVID, but like there are some what COVID was uh, exposed was the systematic failure, right? And for the Asian American community, it was all the all of the hate attacks that nobody took seriously for so long, no matter how much we talked about it. And, and the shame of the former president calling this the coronavirus, which put you know, anybody who looked um, Chinese um, under attack. Uh, but you know, if you look at everybody, you know, it's like, it's like you know, not to be glib about it, but it's like you know, anybody who looks Chinese, um, we're all getting beat up. Um, and you know, racists can't tell the difference between in Korean and Chinese. And certainly, I'm certainly not advocating for you know, people to identify, you know, are you Chinese before you do anything? But it is the fact that like, um, we are seen as, you know, a monolithic community um, and that we are, and oftentimes, you know, we are attacked because people see us as the perpetual foreigners, you know? And that shows up in all the ways that people to ask us the question of, I mean, like I know Alice and Karen can, and you can talk about how many times people say to us, uh, oh my gosh, you know, like, where are you from? Where are you really from, right? Well, we're from here, <laughs> we're Americans. And I think I think being painted, always being painted in question as the outsider um, makes it easy for people to harm us because they don't think we they don't think we belong here. And so it's easy to target um, anybody who looks, you know, anybody in the East Asian community right now. Yeah, you know, I want to sort of share an anecdotal story of mine, right? You talk about systemic bias. Um, you know, before I came to Channel 7, I was asked by every single news director, every single agent, every single speech coach, with the exception of the news director of Channel 7 who hired me, I was asked this question, is English your first language? Mm -hmm. That's a remarkably, right, sort of subtle, but not so subtle, right, subliminal, if not intentional, systemic bias. And, and you sort of touched on this fact that we've never shared a common history. Well, I would argue that we're sharing a common history now. Right. Absolutely. And that is what has been so pivotal about this moment. And I would even go further to your point about and I'm coming to you next, Alice, to keep your keep your answer ready. Um, this point about coalition building. Right. In a lot of ways, I look at this moment 
as sort of a continuation of the civil rights movement in the summertime that we saw, right? For the first time we saw this broader coalition, you know, the Asian American community out there on the streets, uh, standing side by side, allyship. And when we started to see these attacks, you know, elevated in the media in the beginning of this year, I think the frustration was, well, what about us, right? Like we are, we are fighting for equality across the board and to reciprocate that. And so I do think that looking at this as sort of a unified struggle can be maybe the silver lining in all of this and how you move forward. So uh, good point there. And I'm coming to you next. Alice, same question to you. Um, how have you sort of noticed on the ground this moment being different in that way? We've seen a huge activation, I think, not only of our, exist, our, our allies that have worked with us throughout the year, CBC's has, we serve 60,000 people every single year, right? So what I see is like a generational activation. We have a leadership council. We have a younger generation saying, we thought we, we, we did exactly what our parents wanted us to do. We never got in trouble. We went to school, we did well, we're successful professionally. And we are scared for our lives. We're scared for our parents' lives. And they're contacting our organization. They're saying, what can we do? And I think I would, you know, even not push back, but I would just, just say like the, the, uh, uh, the inability of races to define, to, to kind of figure out what ethnicity you are, isn't new, right? Vincent Chin was killed, even though he was Chinese because he was mistaken for, for someone who's Japanese, for some steel workers, for some auto workers who thought their jobs were being fled. So I think this racism has very deep roots in this country, but I do think that there is organizing going on in a younger generation, but also in among millennials, I will say like I'm part of the millennials in the thirties and forties, people who thought that they were American, people who thought that they were part of this community who through these racist accents are saying, I have to reconcile my preconceptions with what the, what the current reality is, which mm -hmm. is my appearance is putting me and my family's appearance and my loved one's appearances are are in or the, the the reason why we're in danger yeah that's a good point i mean i would add to that that you know this to me necessarily isn't a, a new trend i think all of us on the ground know this right this has always happened listen the first time i was called a racial slur was not last year and it was not you know when the last administration came into office right i mean we we're born in the skin we know that we face bias for all of our lives here what i truly think is happening here is an inflection point again where it's not that this is all new, the attacks. What's new is we're finding our voice. We're awakening, right? We are culturally not accustomed to wearing our pain and trauma publicly. And that is not an American way, right? Let's just be honest. Americanness, you have to make noise to, to earn what's yours. And in some ways, I look at this moment as sort of an evolution of, of our community, right? We're sort of Americanizing, understanding the importance of, of speaking out. So I, I do want to sort of you know, highlight that that observation that I've had in my mind throughout all this time. Karen, I want to come to you next. Um, for those of the folks here who are not familiar with the organization, Homecrest Community Services, just to sort of uh, pull a, 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 a news event, I suppose, that maybe we can all relate to. In last July, there was an 89-year-old uh, Chinese-American grandmother who, horrifying story, was lit on fire. And it was Homecrest, uh, where, she, where she had, um, she's a member of, that came to her support, um, I can't even imagine what she would have done without Homecrest, right? I just can't even imagine. Her story would never have been told. She probably would have never told her own family. Uh, I interviewed her and she told me that she didn't even tell her own kids until the following day. Again, very Asian, right? Uh, not wanting the, her kids to worry. Um, so, you know, it's located in Bensonhurst, uh, South Brooklyn, a very vibrant, large, rich Asian American community. According to most recent reports by the city, uh, many of them immigrants, uh, and it has the largest number of Chinese born residents in any neighborhood in the city, even more than Flushing, Queens, which may be surprising to many. So, Karen, for you, uh, what concerns do you hear from the local community in Bensonhurst, um, where we've seen, quite frankly, a, a lot of the uh, incidents there? And, and what challenges are, are facing the older members in particular there? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thanks, Stefan. Definitely last year was um, um, caught us all by surprise. It was unprecedented uh, what happened with COVID, but um, we did not expect that we would have a member uh, um, be attacked 
um, on the streets. Um, and so uh, your story and highlighting what happened to our here uh, during this, um, this, this time on, in the pandemic was very, very important. Um, and I think it's because, um, you know, many Asians, they um, sometimes when things happen to them, um, they're afraid to report and uh, it's um, and certainly they don't want to tell their kids about it because they're they're also fearful that they're going to cause um, problems or that um, their children will worry um, and prevent them from going out and so they they there's this um, oh sorry I think I'm pressing the wrong thing okay um, apologize um, so it's some of the concerns that we've been hearing the challenges faced by older adults is, is certainly number one, public safety um, because of this incident, what happened to the senior and uh, other incidents um, like hers uh, where you know, we're concerned about um, their safety, how they're gonna go about their daily lives um, and uh, I think that uh, that's that's something that's still continuing to be an issue. Um, we've had to work uh, very closely with the NYPD um, to ask for uh, more um, support, um, especially at this time where uh, seniors are afraid to go out. Um, another challenge that is faced by the older community is mental wellness. Um, Prior to the pandemic, uh, the senior centers uh, was a place for uh, many of our members to come to for activities and um, it kept them busy. They were able to hang out with their friends. And during this pandemic uh, where they have to be uh, socially distanced, um, many were socially isolated. Um, they were home homebound for most of the time. And so, uh, their mental wellness um, is, is, has been affected, um, uh, particularly um, you know, men anxieties and depression, um, coupled with the rise in the anti-Asian hate. Um, so it's just important that immigrant communities uh, get funding and mental health services um, to adequately address uh, these growing needs. Can't even imagine, and I can. I think we can say that we all are afraid for our older New Yorkers here. Your, your microphone might need to be a little jacked up when we come back to you. So just if you can work on that, uh, let me go through sort of piggyback off of that point. Um, speaking of, you know, what Homecrest does for their members, uh, so much uh, to do. One through line of the movement to combat anti-AIPA hate in the community is through education and empowerment. So uh, Alice uh, and Joanne, uh, I'll start with Alice first. Um, your organizations do some work in this area, like bystander intervention training, knowing your knowing your uh, trainings and things like that. Alice, can you speak to that sort of uh, sort of on the ground practical work happening? Sure, and I think it's a couple of things that we're doing. We are in the middle of creating um, a curriculum, which, which is which will educate folks on to be anti-racist, but through the lens of Asian American history, something that we're seeing a lot in terms of education is not only how do you protect yourself in the specific instance in which you feel like you're in danger, but also I'm Asian American, who am I? What is my role in this, in this country? So I think that piece of education has been really important and we're in the middle of creating that curriculum in terms of training that we're giving that will make people feel safer, but also feel prepared when they're in situations in which they feel as though, you know, they feel a little bit unsafe is we partner with everyone from the Fed with working with the Federation with Holler Back um, to the New York City Commission on Human Rights because we also acknowledge in addition to the violence that's happening to our community, it's not the only acts of discrimination, right? In terms of a personal story, I saw a friend on Facebook post last week that her parents were trying to buy a house and because it was in a in in a in a place in New York City where you know I they were touring the home and they were speaking in Chinese, the sellers pulled out. And she was like, I don't know what I can do. And so working with organizations like the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and the Commission of Human Rights, we're also educating people to say, 
you have rights in these situations. They cannot discriminate against you because you are Asian American. And I think that's also um, an important piece of the education. And just sort of tie a bow on that, that is like something that the, uh, the Black community has faced forever into this Absolutely. day, right? So these connections cannot be ignored, right? I want to go back to what I said earlier. People often ask, what can you do? I mean, first, allyship, right? Stand up for your neighbor. And I say that to members of our own community, too. You can't just do this for your own community, right? Like, when you see wrong, you have to speak up. Um, people always ask me, you know, when I go to these rallies as an occupational hazard, I, I always scan, I always scan the field, right? I look at who's there. And you'd be surprised at how empowering it is to members of the API community to see, you know, other people there who don't look like them just standing there, right? That goes a long way. So I would say to folks who feel like they're helpless, that there's so many simple things you can do um, that go a long way. So um, Joey, let me come back to you. Same question. I mean, in terms of like, you know, on the ground, practical training, uh, empowerment, things like that. What do you guys do? You're muted right now. And it's weird hearing you with, without, well, on mute, to be quite honest. <laughs> totally. Um, so I also want to go back to uh, what Alice had said and, uh, and just to talk about, you know, what is happening with our community. I think this really is that transformative moment for the entire Asian American community. Because I think for all of us, me and Karen and Alice, we all work to eradicate poverty. I think that's ultimately the work that we do is to fight poverty in our communities. Uh, but I think what is happening with all the anti-Asian hate crimes and discrimination really transcends class, right? Because, um, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. If you're outside, exactly what you said, you know, the, the skin that we live in, we don't get to unzip it as we go outside. And so no matter how wealthy you are or how poor you are, when you go outside and you meet the wrong person, um, you know, you could be targeted. And I think this is a lot of um, upper middle class, wealthy Asian Americans who never had to deal with, you know, what is happening to our community, especially the, um, the low income community. I think they're now experiencing, you know, what we've been talking about for years. And I think, slow, you know, the light is coming on and I think they realize, oh yeah. So, you know, um, the fact that I, you know, earn a ton of money and I live in a fancy neighborhood, doesn't matter because I'm also getting targeted, right? And so that's something that I, I'm starting to notice because there are more and more um, big, rich hedge fund groups asking me to come and talk about this thing and everybody nods. And the thing I always like to do is have people, the Asian Americans in these groups that I'm invited to talk about their own experience. And I'm going to tell you, everybody has a story these days of like, our own discrimination. And I think we need to create space, like Karen said about mental health, right? Having to scream about mental health for years. Um, we all have that story that we need, we wanna share. But what we've been doing has been, I think I've talked to every media outlet in this country and even overseas. I had to step up until like two in the morning to talk to like some Singapore TV, right? Like so everybody wants to hear what is going on. And it's sadly, it's a, uh, it's a sad reflection about our safety and, and a lot of people are really concerned. Um, for us, we launched our Hope Against Hate, uh, but before that, um, we were doing um, upstander trainings. Uh, we created materials with Center for Anti-Violence uh, Education. I wanna thank the Brooklyn Community Foundation because the funding that they gave us, we actually used that to create the booklets and to do the, safe, the upstander safety videos. Um, and I thought it was just, you know, and, and it's not the safety video. It's like, this is how you keep, keep yourself alive when you're attacked. It is, you're, we're, we're, you need to figure out a window to keep yourself safe so you can make that quick getaway, right? From when you, are, when you could be attacked. But the booklets, the upstander booklets that we've created and the safety videos we've created, you know, people from all over the country are using that. Like Iowa and Kentucky and like the most random places, people are using that. And, you know, I hope Brooklyn Community Foundation, they're really um, proud of the investments that they've made because it's not just in Brooklyn. As a pr proud Brooklynite, you know, I can say, you know, I'm thrilled that, you know, the community foundation in my borough is doing such great work. But this is going across the country because I think these are some really important resources. And when we think about, you know, and the other thing we, you know, with our Hope Against Hate, it's certainly, um, it's on our website. So I encourage everybody to take a look at it. But um, it's also, you know, raising community awareness, exactly what you said with Karen, with Alice, 
you know, we need to get people out of their homes and to be able to have people meet each other. There needs to be a lot of solidarity work happening from communities of color, but all New Yorkers. Um, you know, we're, I was privileged to be able to join a group of Black and Asian pastors, uh, religious uh, community meeting together. I think there's a lot of really great organizing going on. And we all need to tap into those, um, those groups because I think the work of not just um, the anti-Asian hate, but just, you know, fighting discrimination, fighting racism, fighting poverty, that is the work that we all need to do together. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of work to do and there's plenty of, we need a lot of help and a lot of hands. You know, I'm glad you brought up poverty and, and uh, to quote you, the, the hedge fund money, right? Because uh, six years ago, I did a story that I think shocked a lot of people, it shocked myself. It was about those casino buses where you know we have this stereotype that oh these elder these older New Yorkers they go to gamble and what I uncovered was that more than half of them were making this trip just to pocket that that credit that the casino gives you to make about eighteen dollars a day and that was that was how they ate that was how they survived they they traveled two hours one way a four way journey waiting five hours in a cold bus stop right nine hours of basically just that to make eighteen dollars and and I think the point that I wanted to raise here is that, you know, uh, there's this model minority myth that, that Asian Americans are affluent and we've made it. And it's really sort of been quite damaging, right? Because the truth is by the city's own statistics in that year, Asian Americans had the highest poverty rate of any ethnic, ethnic group in the city at, at 24%. That's almost one in four Asian Americans are living below the poverty line. Now the numbers got a little better since then. It's a little above 21%, but it's, it's, it's alarmingly and, and staggeringly high and I think the point I want to tie this into when I bring Karen into this is that, you know, we as, again, I come back to this theme, we as a, as a, as a culture are not accustomed to, to speaking about our struggles publicly, uh, whether it's shame or whether it's just the way we go about life. And there's a disconnect there, right? Because these communities, these organizations get less than 2% of all the funding that goes to poverty prevention, right? And yet there's one in four, one in, more than one in five. So by not speaking out, we're, we're missing out on resources that quite frankly, the community desperately needs. And so this is where I pivot to Karen here. Um, I know that the speaking out part seems to be resonating quite a bit with second generation Asian Americans in this country, right? We, we've been here long enough now, many of us born and raised here, but for the older members of the community, and that's where you're really plugged into, do you really sense that they're understanding the importance of speaking out? What, what's the pulse there? Okay, we definitely can't hear you right now. Oh, we can't, okay, all right. Okay, that's better. Is this better? Yeah, that's better. All right, I was, I was gonna try the mic that I had. Yeah, um, A for effort though. Okay, yay. Uh, the, um, what we're hearing on our end, uh, with, particularly with the, um, the, the Chinese uh, immigrants uh, in southern, southern Brooklyn, is that they also feel um, a need to speak up, for sure. Um, as, you know, they felt marginalized um, for, for many, many years. They've never felt like they had a voice, but they're starting to see that it is important to come out to be to have a united front, and to um, you know to go to these rallies to to really uh, stand up uh, against hate. Um, so uh, we we just started a um, storytelling uh, art project with our seniors, and we had a very somber uh, talk with them about the all the issues that we've been seeing. Um, uh, affecting the Asian community, especially the anti-Asian hate. And we wanted to use art as a way for them to express and share how they felt. Um, and so uh, they've, they've been able to um, use um, uh, what they learned in that class uh, to create a video. So I'll just, I'll just share it with you via the chat and you can check it out uh, if you get a chance. But Ultimately, what they're saying is that, you know, we're all immigrants here in this country. We all came as immigrants and we all want the same thing to have, you know, to live um, uh, the American dream. And um, 
they saw this hate as as um, dividing the country, um, and they also feel that you know we should have the ability to live um, free of free of hate, free of fear, um, and that um, you know we should have equity um, for all communities. And it's really encouraging to hear that even among the older uh, population that they're starting to get this, because that, that was one thing that I wasn't really sure about, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, in the interest of time, because we do want to get to a, a robust Q&A, and I want to remind folks here that you can submit questions now um, when we get to that, and, and I'll be there to answer some questions as well. But I want to end on this, and I do think that this topic, uh, we want to hear, it deserves to hear from each and every one of you, but I want I know it's complicated, it's not an easy answer, but if you can in the interest of time, try to keep this a little tight. Um, we can't ignore the issue of policing, um, not only particularly because we are being, we've been discussing, you know, uh, bias attacks, but look where we are today in current events. This is obviously, you know, the uh, the underlying theme in all of this. And um, I think we all have different perspectives on this. Uh, to characterize this fairly, I'll say that you know I think we can all agree that policing, or in some people's views, over policing, uh, is at least not the single singular answer here, right? There, there needs to be sort of a holistic, broader approach. It's only one part of the solution. So uh, I'm gonna start with Alice. Um, when it comes to that topic, uh, what can we do aside from policing less, more, whatever it is, uh, supplemental to it, to really address the broader problem here? Yeah, so one, I think that restorative justice needs, there needs to, I think it's like in two parts. One, there needs to be more options other than just increased policing and jailing more people and, or, do, or, or not reporting and, and doing nothing, right? Because those are the options right now. Like someone, you know, in the height of the pandemic threatened to beat me up on the train. So my options were to report it and this person might've ended up in a jail system where COVID is running rampant, so it could have been a life sentence or to not report it. So there needs to be more alternatives to incarceration. There needs to be restorative justice. And third, if there are individuals, and there are individuals in New Yorkers who need supportive services, who need mental health services, those wraparound services should be provided to vulnerable populations so that they receive the help they need and they don't pose a greater danger to other members in the city. Okay, thank you for that very thoughtful answer. Joanne, same question to you. We've seen a lot of increased police presence given uh, what's been happening in our community as of late. What's been the reaction in your view from your community standpoint of uh, seeing more police officers out there? No, this is a tough question, Stefan. We've talked about it, you and I as friends and um, you know, I think it's really complicated. I think, um, by the way, can I just answer the senior question? Sure. <laughs> um, the senior population, um, the Asian American senior population is the fastest growing and they're also the poorest. And so some of the statistics that people might not rec uh, realize is that, you know, some of the highest rates of suicide happen in the, uh, with Asian senior women in this country. And so um, what Karen said about mental health is a very real issue for all of us. And I think Part of that, you know, the lack of seeking out services comes from the stigma in our own community, but also it's the fact that there aren't appropriate language services. You know, um, we don't have enough people who speak language, the language to be able to offer services. And I think that's something that we really need to have conversations about. But back to the police question. Um, I've said this to a lot of people. I said this to you. Um, I think there's a role for police, certainly. You know, I, the example I use is, when somebody is chasing you down the street with an ax, right? Like, you're not gonna call social service agency, you're gonna need to call the police to be able to help, right? But I think over the years, we have defaulted to the police on too many things. I think, you know, um, I don't think NYPD should be responsible for responding to when there's a mental health crisis, for instance, right? I think there need, I know, I know that that conversation is happening at city council right now, but the problem with that is that they're not trained to deal with that. Um, and, and I've been told too by the police officers and the detectives themselves, they have one day of training um, on how to deal with mental health issues, right? How to deal with people with mental health. So why are we asking them to take on a role that they're not trained for? They're trained to look at a situation in a very specific way. 
And so over the years, because we didn't have a solution and we were, to be honest, I think we were all, the system was too cowardly to say, this is what we need to tackle. This is what we need to get to. So we just kept dumping everything to NYPD. Okay, NYPD, you do this, you do this. I think that's, you know, for me, it's like, well, let's take some of these pieces back. Um, they shouldn't be released, you know, um, addressing, they shouldn't be going down to chase down homeless people. I think, I think we shouldn't ask them to go and um, deal with mental health patients. I think there are lots of different ways for us to address that. So I think those are the conversations that I want to get to. Um, and part of that is our Hope Against Hate uh, campaign. All of our work in that campaign is how do we not get the police involved, right? How do we do all of the pre-stuff before we call the police, creating communities, com making people talk to each other, make, you know, like creating these um, safety zones in the neighborhoods where people know that who they can call on, um, being able to be, you know, talk to the small businesses, the nonprofit organizations, the places of worship, to be able to look at like, who are the people in the community who can step, step in and help you, right? And beyond the Asian community too. I think that's what, um, our plan really is about. And we want to be able to, you know, we want to replicate this model in as many neighborhoods as possible. And it's really about moving beyond the Asian uh, community. And, and, and the final thing is, you know, Safan, a lot of um, Asian American leaders um, off the record have asked me the question, do you think other communities care about us, right? Like, mm -hmm. do you think the Black, Latino, and the white community care about us? Do they understand what is happening? Do you think they stand in solidarity? And my answer always has been absolutely. You know, they're really horrified by what we're seeing, um, especially the Black and the Latino community, because I think they understand what discrimination and, um, you know, uh, xenophobia looks like. And so, yes, they've been very strong and they've been very vocal to stand with us. And um, I think this is the moment where we start to transcend, you know, the silos that we live in. And to be able to say, you know, as we come out of COVID, uh, what are the shared values that we have as New Yorkers, as people? Um, and how will we, you know, how will we tackle these challenges of discrimination about ra of racism? It really is about all of us, all of us versus racism versus, you know, it's just the Asian community. Everybody's experienced this. And, you know, sadly, another community the next day are going to, they're going to deal with this. Another community is going to deal with this. The, and so for us as an Asian American community, how will we use the experience that we've, uh, that we've uh, acquired and you know, the solutions that we've created to stand in solidarity with other communities? I think, I think there's so many important conversations that are happening right now. And I'm actually really heartened by, you know, heartened by um, the honest that, honesty that we're all sharing. Um, and yeah. the fact that there might, you know, we're slowly emerging and our eyes are opening that you know, all of this really is all of us in it together. Yeah, I, I see the same thing. You know, you, you see a lot of finger pointing on social media and it's, it's social media is not an accurate reflection of society, right? I would say that on the ground, I've noticed the same thing. And it's not just from community leaders, average New Yorkers, uh, black, brown, white, yellow, doesn't matter. There's a human level that I think we all connect to. And, and I would agree that uh, this resonates and there are more allies than there are you know, the other. So I think that's important to note. Um, Karen, uh, fascinating to hear your take on this because I would imagine with the older population, uh, particularly the older immigrant population, they may have a slightly different view on this. What's been their response to seeing an increased police presence in the neighborhood? Well, it's, it's a little different because the, um, their experiences with the police is, is very different. Um, Asian community has has um, kind of very few interactions with the police. Um, um, it's, it's the neighborhoods that we're, we're in, uh, particularly in Southern Brooklyn. Um, we don't really have um, too many arrests of Asian, um, Asian individuals. And so I think from looking from that lens, um, they're, not, um, they're not opposed to having the police um, step up patrol if there's more crime that's happening in the community because they do they just want the crime to go away they want the police to make an arrest um, so they're just looking at it from a safety perspective um, so it's a little different uh, I think um, because the experiences are different um, and um, I feel for 
the black community that has gone through time and time again, you know, um, the uh, profiling and the racial um, uh, racial profiling um, and arrests of of um, um, just the same the same arrests for um, and uh, sometimes also wrongly arrests. Uh, so I I do feel that it is a systematic uh, problem that has to be addressed and fixed. Um, but it's it's definitely different. So it's like apples and oranges. It's different. It's different here. Um, uh, the elders, the seniors, they 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 want to have the police presence because in case there is a crime, they want to be able to run over to the police or have the police be available um, to make an arrest. Um, so it's a little different. Yeah, no, this goes back to the whole thing that it's not monolithic, right? I mean, even among the same Chinese American population, they have different generations seeing it differently. Um, we went a little over on this portion, but uh, you know, this was a meaningful and thoughtful discussion. They want to cut it off, but do want to save some time, not a whole lot left for some q and I'm going to pass this now back to Marcella, I believe, who can open this up to the floor. Stefan, thank you so much for um, such a great conversation and Alice, Joanne and Karen, you all have given us a lot of um, great information and you've responded to most of our questions already. A lot of people <laughs> want to know, and I think this is an age old question, what can I do? What can we do um, either within AAPI communities or speaking as an outsider or someone who wants to speak to outsiders about how to support them and their loved ones? Um, and you all gave so many rich um, um, examples of what can be done. There is a very unique question that's in our Q&A box that I'd love to hear your response to. Um, and of course, Stefan, I'm in, in encouraging you to respond as well. Um, D. Ang asks, with elections coming up, how can we leverage um, everything that's happening in terms of like increased solidarity, increased mobili mobilization within AAPI communities? Um, how can that be leveraged um, with mayoral and district attorney candidates, and anyone is free to chime in. That's wow, that's a simple one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, right? <laughs> what question, do we do? Yang. Alice, let's start with you. I, I will say we have a leadership council which is made up of mid-curve professionals and their entire project is civic engagement for the next two months for people who may not know. In about two months at the end of June, we are electing a new mayor, half our city council is turning over. And if you want your voice to be heard in city government that doles out billions of dollars each year and funds organizations like the ones you see on the screen, getting involved, voting. I will say campaigns look at how, they don't only look at how, whether or not you vote, they look at how often you vote. They look at what communities vote. And those are the communities, and I will say, in, in an ideal world, any elected official would look at the demographics of their constituency and say, I'm gonna serve everyone. Unfortunately, we live in the real world and, and elected officials will, you know, there's a saying, the squeaky, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So I will say one thing you can do is to, you know, learn about candidates, get involved. You can talk to your neighbors, to your family about registering to vote, which you can still do and get involved in that process. Awesome, thank you, Alice. Um, others who have responses. Joanne, I see you come on into the conversation. Sure, um, I would, my message is for all the folks who are running, um, not just the mayoral candidates, but all of the, um, the city council members, like Alice said, two thirds of the council is turning over, right? Um, you need to engage us. You know, uh, the Asian American community, we're the fastest growing population. We're 16% of the population. Um, I think everybody automatically assumes that, you know, all the Asians will vote for only the Asian community, right? That is, you know, really doing short, you know, that's giving short shrift to our community. Our community is sophisticated. We run the range of opinions. And then everybody says, you know, like, you know, what is it that the Asian American community wants, right? That's the question I get a lot. What is it that you guys want? Well, we want what Karen has said. We want what everybody else wants. We want to live in a safe, safe. We want safe safety in our home. We want to live in affordable housing. We want safety. We want good jobs. We want our kids to go to good schools, right? Safe schools. We want what everybody else wants. The needs of the Asian American community and what we want from 
from society isn't different than any other community, right? And so I hope that the candidates will campaign and engage our community understanding that, that we're not like some special interest group, right? Like we are, we are Americans and so you need to talk to us as Americans. Um, and then also understanding that um, we are watching all of the issues. We're, ask, we're watching how you answer. Um, and so don't automatically assume, you know, everybody ever, can I just tell you that I get, I get more Andrew Yang questions from media than anybody else. Yeah, I wonder some, why. <laughs> I, I want, I, I'm going to call Andrew and say, Andrew, you need to pay me, man, right? Like <laughs> at this point, because everybody asks me an Andrew Yang question. And I have to say, I think our community is, um, will vote for who actually makes the most sense, right? Um, for them, for, for individually, individually, I have yet to decide. Um, I need to look at all of the platforms. The Asian American Federation is going to be holding a candidates forum, I think, on the 27th. So I encourage people to come. Um, we and you know everybody wants to talk to me because they want to know what we're thinking i'm thinking what well, you know what we want we want what everybody else wants please understand our community please understand the diversity please understand yeah. the diversity of need and then when you come 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 with solutions that everybody else is working towards fighting poverty fighting discrimination um now more than ever and understanding that our community is um to in we are at least 10 percent of the population in over in about 28 of the 51 city council districts so we are spreading out yeah. we are powerful um engage us and, and i'll just add to that as a journalist i'll make it quick here because we're short on time um you know my role as a journalist the way i see it is i'm a voice for the voiceless doesn't matter what community it is it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be my own community right and so if you are asking the question about what can you get out of these candidates continue to come speak to journalists like, like myself who can amplify your voice because my job is not to amplify theirs they, they have their voice right yes i'm mm -hmm. here to amplify the voice so um again same theme keep speaking out because that's how you keep them accountable great thank you so much karen do you have uh, a response to that question yes um uh i i also agree with sifan about um speaking out against hate, um, just we have to keep speaking out. And I also believe that we have to move beyond, beyond the conversation, um, um, beyond the binary, um, because everything has been, for us Asians, we kind of feel like we don't belong anywhere. You know, it's, it's the conversations have always been black and white and, in, um, and, and Asians don't have a lane. <laughs> We don't know where we fit, um, but we want we want to be able to also tell our stories and have representation, and um, also for people to come to our communities and see what it's like. Um, so it's um, it's actually very. Uh, I like to just just talk briefly about um, Mississippi. I went down there. Uh, in 2019, there is a uh, Chinese American community that's established, uh, have roots going back uh, to uh, the 18, 1900s. And um, they live side by side with the black community. And, um, but because of how the, uh, the structure at that time, everybody had their own lane, you know, and they weren't allowed to mix um, because of these lanes. And we've kind of moved beyond that. I feel like we're, we're in a different uh, phase now yeah. um, where we're more accepting. But back then, um, you know, when you're talking about uh, issues, Asians were not even seen. We were pretty much invisible. And so um, I think now we're getting more traction as far as our community seeing the need to participate civically. Um, to vote, to um, to ask questions, and yes. um, you know, for us to to really speak out about things that do matter. And these and issues. Karen, I'm sorry, we're we're out of time, and so we're going to have to leave it there. Um, but I do, in closing, want to echo the very um, I think reminder you're providing us, which is that there is a rich legacy of um, not just presence of 
communities within the, the AAPI community. Um, and that history in this country is very rich and very deep. Um, there's also a rich legacy of building power, using power, fighting for rights. And so what we're seeing over the past year is uh, intensification, a reactivation in some respects um, of that power. And um, so I wanna thank you all for the work that you all are doing within your organizations and on your platforms um, and extend my most sincere thanks to you all, Karen, Joanne, Alice, Safan, for joining us today. We're so grateful for your time and expertise um, and just the incredible work that you continue to do. Uh, as I mentioned at the top of the webinar, our next phase of grant making will bring the Brooklyn COVID-19 Response Fund's total commitment to nearly $7 million, and we know that this work is far from over. Um, for AAPI communities, for Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color, the barriers to quality health care, education, housing, financial security, fighting poverty, as was mentioned, those needs will not disappear when the pandemic subsides. Real change doesn't happen overnight, and that's why we're here um, to invest over the long term in structural change, and we're continuing to fundraise to make that make that possible. Um, change starts here, as we've said, and it starts with you. Please consider making a donation today to invest in a better Brooklyn for a better future for Brooklyn uh, at bcfny.org/donate. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us for this conversation and be sure to sign up for upcoming webinars in our series at bcfny.org or um, bcfny webinars. Uh, upcoming webinars include a discussion next week on Tuesday, April 27th at 1230 on immigration and Biden's first 100 days. We're featuring guests Murad Awalde, um, Interim Co-Executive Director of New York Immigration Coalition, Abraham Paulos, Deputy Director of Black Alliance for Just Immigration, and Mazen Sadamed, Co-Executive Director at Documented, as well as a talk that we have coming up with Heather McGee on her new book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together, which is happening on Tuesday, May 11th at 12.30 p.m. We hope you all will join us. And once again, we thank you all for your engagement, your participation, and our panelists for your expertise. Be well.